All right, everyone, welcome to the STOA. My name is Katie Kelly, and today we are joined by special guest Joseph Tainter. Dr. Joseph Tainter is an anthropologist and historian, as well as a professor at Utah State University. We recently read his book, The Collapse of Complex Societies, as part of our ViewQuake book club. So that's where each month we read a book that has the potential to rattle our worldviews. And on Sunday, we got together for a discussion. We went over some of the main arguments of the book and had, had an open talk about some of those ideas. So today I'm gonna to be interviewing Joseph for about 20 minutes, and then we'll move on to an audience Q&A. He's graciously accepted questions from us. If at any time you all have a question, please pop it into the chat and Peter's gonna be looking out for questions throughout. So anything that you wanna ask him, go ahead and type it in at any point. Thanks so much for being here, Joseph. All right, well, before we pop into the first question, I'm gonna briefly summarize some of the main ideas in the book. I'll go ahead and share my screen here with the presentation that we did on Sunday. Just one moment. So as defined by Dr. Tainter, complex societies are problem-solving organizations in which more parts, different kinds of parts, and more social differ differentiation, more inequality, and more kinds of centralization and control emerge as circumstances require. And four basic concepts to understand the collapse of complex societies. Human societies are problem-solving organizations. These sociopolitical systems require energy for their maintenance. And as they become more complex, that carries with it increased costs per capita, meaning that eventually investment in sociopolitical complexity as a problem solving response reaches a point of declining marginal returns. So Dr. Tainter, in your book, which was written in 1990 or 1988, uh, you made a strong case for declining marginal returns in areas such as education and technological innovation in our own society. However, you said that our society was not at risk of collapse because collapse has only taken place in a power vacuum. Could you relate your model to the state of our current society today and perhaps explain anything about your analysis that might have changed since the time the book was written? I'll go ahead and click on mute. Okay, um, I am unmuted now. Um, yes, okay. I, I've been concerned about a number of factors over the last few years. I mean, you know, the research for the book, as you mentioned, was done in the 1980s. And since then, my work has shifted increasingly to um, concern about sustainability in, in our own society and, and in our future. You know, as I was doing the book, I realized that what I was learning was not just about ancient societies, it had definite implications for us today. And what I would say at the present time is that the, the, the situation that really bothered me the most was in 2008, and it was not the financial downturn, it was the availability of oil and the fact that oil was going to $140 a barrel. And if it continued on that trajectory, I found myself wondering, do we have 20 years left for our way of life? Now, what happened since then is that we developed hydraulic fracturing, what's called fracking. None of us likes the environmental consequences of fracking, but I have to say that it saved us. It bailed us out from what was looking like a declining uh, ability to produce oil at an energy profit. So I, I, I was concerned in, in those days, 2008 to 2009, about the simple availability of the energy that we need. Um, and, but, but I'm not so concerned about that anymore because fracking gave us a reprieve. Uh, it's given us, I would say, a few decades uh, to complete a transition to renewable and hopefully less polluting sources of, of energy. One thing that concerns me now uh, is the conjunction between globalization in supply chains, which is uh, much talked about these days, but it's not usually linked to the phenomenon of what's called just-in-time delivery. 
Just-in-time delivery means that if let's say General Motors is going to produce 3,000 pickup trucks in a day, then 3,000 starter motors arrive at the plant just in time. 3,000 alternators, 3,000 sets of tires. Everything arrives just in time, so companies no longer have to pay um, storage costs. Uh, they no longer have to pay warehousing costs. Um, now, the company that we all know, Amazon, is very good at warehousing, but most companies now practice just-in-time delivery as much as they can. If you combine globalization and any, um, I mean, I mean, any shipment today between continents, a single ship may contain parts for thousands, even tens of thousands of ultimate products. If you combine that with just-in-time delivery, it has created a vulnerability that we have not really understood or addressed. And the recent problems that we've had in supply chains arising from the coronavirus, I think have given us a warning shot. Um, if you have to wait four months to buy a new car, that's annoying, but it's not a big deal. But what if your grocery store can't obtain what it needs for you to, to buy your dinner? Uh, this, this is the kind of concern that I am increasingly worried about. And it's simply, even, in, even after the coronavirus hit us, I don't see people recognizing this potential problem. Thank you. Um, I'm curious, in your model now of complex societies, do you consider with the amount of globalization that's occurred since you wrote this book, our society to be one integrated global society or do you still see us as parts of separate complex societies in your analysis? Well, we are in a way a, a largely integrated global society, but that's primarily economically. To a lesser extent, politically, uh, mostly behind the leadership of the United States. Um, but, but other than that, no. I mean, we clearly have uh, severe problems in, in the international sphere, and some of these problems need to be growing. When it comes to the concerns that you just brought up about just-in-time delivery and that kind of vulnerability, would you see us as one integrated society in that respect? or? Well, less so than we used to be, because we mm -hmm. rely on so much from other countries now, much less so than we used to be. Okay. Uh, in the context of various tightly integrated neighboring societies, um, where many are complex, you talked about in your book that there was kind of a mutually assured complexification where rather than collapse being possible um, due to the rivalrous dynamics, complexification would continue to increase even in the face of diminishing marginal returns. Uh, what happens as this type of behavior accelerates and goes forward and perhaps reaches its limits? I think I need you to narrow that down to specific fields to ask me what happens under diminishing returns in specific areas of, of what we engage in. Are you talking about politics? Are you talking about economics? Are you talking about military technology? Um, you know, I, I need something more specific. Sure. Um, well, the situation that you brought up earlier that concerned you a while back was diminishing returns on oil, on mm -hmm. energy. Um, and now that we have fracking technology, although we all hate it, that has kind of bought us some time. Um, what do you see occurring if, say, diminishing returns on energy diminish further before we develop potential alternatives that are viable? One of the things that concerned me um, back in 2008 um, was, was simply the energy return on producing energy. Uh, we have a, an, an acronym we use for that. It's called EROI, e it stands for Energy Return on Investment. It takes energy to get energy. And what matters is not how much is left in the ground, it's the energy cost of getting it out. What kind of energy profit do you get from producing energy? Now, to give an example, uh, in 1940, the United States produced oil and gas at an EROI, an energy profit of, of 100 to, about 100 to 1. Uh, what that means is that for every barrel of oil we would invest in finding and producing more oil, we got 100 barrels back. Okay, more recently, that has been down in the United States to about 15 to 1. And the trend is not reversible. It will continue to decline. 
what happens is, as, as, as humans always do, we always pluck the, the, the low-lying fruit first. Um, we have uh, tapped into and very largely depleted uh, the large shallow pools of oil in places like Oklahoma, Texas, Louisiana, Southern California. And as, as those no longer provide everything we need, we have to go to um, sources of, uh, uh, that are what I call um, cold, remote, and dangerous. Um, places where it simply takes uh, more complex technology and more money and more energy to continue to produce oil. Uh, and, and this carries risks with it. The uh, 2010 um, blowout in the Gulf of Mexico is a perfect example of the kinds of risks. But we're now talking about oil um, off the coast of Greenland. This is the environment that uh, sank the Titanic. Uh, you know, we've been looking, we've been talking about oil in the Arctic. Um, Brazil is, is wanting to produce oil from very deep fields um, out in the Atlantic. That it's simply more and more costly and more and more complex to produce the energy that we need and that we used to get just about for free. So at, as we pluck the low-lying fruit, we have to complexify and invest more and more in continuing to produce energy or to produce just about anything else. One dynamic that you mentioned in the book was that as the low hanging fruit are plucked um, and investment in complexity increases, um, there may be less space for reserves. So perhaps like increasing efficiency or, or things like you mentioned, like, um, like supply chains that, I forget the term that you used, but supply chains that are already in the moment, as opposed to having many backup reserves, might actually be a sign that societies are responding to these diminishing returns. Do you see a, a relationship there? No, no, no. Uh, I mean, just globalization and just in time delivery are simply a function of profit seeking. Um, there are economists who argued that a lot of money was to be saved, which equals money made. By no longer, by first of all, no longer producing things in the United States that can be produced more cheaply elsewhere, and and secondly, by not storing things that uh, th that our companies need to to produce for Americans to consume, or in the case of Europe, for Europeans to consume, or for people in India to consume, um, and 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 this is where the problem of just in time delivery comes in, and why I think it's a vulnerability. Do you see any potential to address this vulnerability through policy or otherwise? Oh, I think it would take a catastrophe. You know, as I said, we've had a warning uh, with the supply chains that we're experiencing now. I don't see any signs that anyone is, is taking the lesson, is understanding the lesson that this has been giving us. So no, I, I think it would, it would take an out and out catastrophe. Although I, I do note that, um, th th that the administration and, and the Congress did recently pass some legislation aiming at bringing more kinds of production back to the United States, particularly uh, in, in the, uh, the IT sphere, um, that more of this will probably be coming back to the United States. I know um, the United States military is very concerned about um, the availability of certain kinds of electronics that are made overseas, and and the military is uncertain about the supply of these, and and they will probably be interested in bringing production of these things back to the United States. In in, in the face of such a catastrophe, do you see potential at this point for society, let's say Western society, to collapse, or do you think that that would be impossible, uh, given the current geopolitical situation where they're wouldn't be a power vacuum? No, I, I think collapse is always a possibility. Um, but it, it would require uh, the complete disruption of um, the, the international economy at this point. So I, I, I would say following up on, on what I wrote in 1988, which was mostly, I mean, that particular observation that you're referring to really worked for ancient societies. But today when the world is so interconnected, um, the, the calculation is simply different. We have to look at, at, at it differently. That makes sense. Are there any other 
changes that or updates that you've you've made to your your framework since 1988 that would be important for us to take into account now? Well, one one small uh, excuse me one small update that I have made is that I, I've expanded my concept of the conditions under which complexity grows. I argued in 88 that complexity grows primarily to solve problems. Um, this is sheer logic because complexity always has a metabolic cost. So why become more complex if it means people have to work harder or we have to produce more? Um, and, and so I, I argued that in past societies where 90% of the population were farmers, uh, and where no one wants to work harder than they, than they need to, that complexity increases to solve problems. I'll modify that now by adding that there are conditions under which complexity increases because of the availability of, let's say, sudden availability of large amounts of energy. This doesn't very, happen very often in human history, but we are in such a period now where we have a fossil fuel economy, and it has given us uh, amounts of energy that past people could never have imagined. Um, and, and, and this causes complexity to grow um, because people generally don't leave energy unused if, if they're able to use it at an economic cost. Uh, and, and it causes complexity to grow primarily because of the commercial sphere, that uh, companies see opportunities that if they innovate, they can produce more stuff. Um, and I mean, information technology is a perfect example of increasing complexity and in what it has done in our lives. Um, it, 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 it makes some things better, um, and in other ways, it just generates um, perpetual nuisances for all of us. Uh, but, but as I say, the situations where humanity has had surplus energy are very rare, and at least in the past, they didn't last very long. You might look at something like... Uh, Maybe the origins of agriculture may have provided surplus energy for a time, but then more children survived, populations grew, villages grew in size, cities were established, states were established, empires were established, and, and all of them sopped up any surplus energy that was available. Um, so, so I go back to my original formulation that almost all the time complexity increases to solve problems. Maybe this information technology would be a good example to talk about the the costs that come per capita to maintain increased complexity. Um, you said that like all of the data and the resources that we have now is bringing some benefits, but also some problems. Could you could you expand on that example? Well, one one problem is vulnerability. Um, you know, there was a time in the 1980s when we were being out, the United States was being out competed by Japan in, in production of what are called DRAM chips. Um, we got around that by shifting production to lower cost producers like South Korea. Um, but I'm not sure that our security was increased by that. Um, I'm sorry, I asked the question again. I think I got a little distracted there. No, that's all right. I was wondering if you could maybe use the IT the example oh, of yeah, IT yeah, as... Actually, I do want to use it. Um, my, recent, my research over the last few years has involved um, the productivity of innovation. And if you look at, let's say, um, cell phones. In the 1980s, the first generation of cell phones needed about 30 elements from the periodic table. Today, cell phones require up to 70 to 80 elements of the periodic table. And that's a trend that's clearly not sustainable. We're gonna run out of elements. Um, also, when I give a talk on this, people always ask me, well, yes, what about Moore's Law? I was a little shocked recently to learn that my students didn't know what Moore's Law is, so I'll explain it. It's not really a law, it's an empirical observation. And the observation is that the density of transistors on a chip doubles every two years at half the cost. That's great. I mean, that's why we all have the phones that we have today at a price we can afford, why we all have laptops at a price we can afford. What, what you are usually not told is that it now takes 18 times more engineers to keep up with Moore's law than, than it did in, let's say, the 1970s. So th these are examples of how complexity does grow and it produces certain gains in our lives. There's no doubt about that but it also has costs that uh, are, are very often not considered and that at least for time may not matter very much as long as we have surplus energy. 
Thank you so much, Joseph. I'm going to go ahead and pass the mic over to Peter for Q&A from the audience. Awesome. Thank you, Katie. Um, so everyone, if you have a question, uh, pop it in the chat and I'll call on you. We might not get to everyone and we're not going to go in order. And please project your, your voice. I think um, uh, Joseph's uh, uh, speaker is not the best. And uh, Joseph, uh, you're going to get questions from all over the place, various different perspectives. This is the, the style of the STOA, so I don't know what's uh, coming at you. Um, but I'm going to take in John Robb from Global uh, Gorillas. Uh, John, uh, you have a question. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. No. Okay, good. Um, thanks for uh, coming, Joseph. Nice to, I'm a big fan of your work, like your stuff. Um, have you looked at, uh, you know, when, when, when I analyze problems, I typically try to go for the bigger frame when the, when the, the problem I'm trying to deal with is, is intractable. And one of the frames I'm working with right now at a global level is the uh, thermodynamic trap. This idea, you take a Prigione's uh, dissipative systems civilization as a dissipative system, grows, 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 still has an external environment, which is the earth, until it becomes the size of the earth. And now we're a closed thermodynamic system running up against limits and every bit of entropy we produce kind of builds up in the background and uh, we rapidly deplete cheap energy sources and we're trying to reduce our entropy production by switching over to dissipation of physical resources like that we're using to build um, solar cells and the like. Um, have you looked at any anything related to that or do you have any thoughts on that idea is that uh, you know the whole idea of a dissipative system you can there's an arrow of time there and there's no deco decomplexification there's no going back. Uh, you have to keep on moving forward like a shark, or you uh, you collapse. Yeah, yes, I'll, I'll use the term technological optimist so I don't criticize my colleagues in any other field. Um, there are people, technological optimists, who believe that, that there are no limits uh, to human to the growth of of human political and economic systems. I mean, this this is clearly absurd. Of course, there are limits. Uh, we have gotten very clever, at, <clears throat> excuse me, at putting those limits off, at temporarily circumventing them, but we can only circumvent them for a time. Uh, it, it's because of this belief that I have switched um, a lot of my research in the last few years into examining the productivity of our system of innovation. And, and what the results that I've had working with some colleagues is that the productivity of our system of innovation is actually declining. Um, since about 1974, which is when our database starts, it's declined by 22%, and it will continue to decline. I mean, the, the example of the number of engineers it takes to keep Moore's law underway is, is a perfect example of that. And I don't know how many engineers it takes, let's say, in the manufacturing sector to produce um, these ever more refined processors. So yes, um, you know, those of us who understand this realize that growth cannot go on forever. And, but, but the short term benefits of growth in terms of the economy and in terms of being elected to political office or retained in political office are such that no one is willing to come to grips with this. No one is willing to say the party's gonna be over something. Yeah. Um... One of the things that we I came up with with others um, when we looked at it from this bigger perspective, the thermodynamic trap kind of perspective, is that um, we have to open up the system, meaning going to space. And um, I'm an astronautical engineer, and, and a lot of people I uh, work with and think of think think through, you know, think in terms of space, not in the sense that we go to canalization or anything like that. It's all near space stuff, uh, you know. Musk broke through the kind of uh, military industrial complex uh, complexification, high launch costs, and destroyed those and brought them down to about $1,000 a kilo. It's dropping, dropping, dropping. And the potential here is to do space-based solar, which is now becoming extremely doable, at, but it's, it's doable at scale where you can have like a whole surface area of the earth done in, inside the Gravity, uh, the magnetic protection, <laughs> and you can have tw about 30 of those. Um, and you can get all the resources. And when we just hit an asteroid, or not, we hit a uh, asteroid the other day, 
you know, millions of miles away, uh, but mining those, starting to switch and put their cloud computing up there and manufacturing up there. Um, it's a, it's a jujitsu move, it's a judo move, but it moves us towards a kind of a, keeps that arrow of time moving forward. And um, it seems improbable now because I think right now we're starting to like get that collapse mindset um, where we're kind of navel gazing and turning inward and saying, we can't go to space. We have to solve all the problems here on earth. Do you see like, uh, first, what do you think of the judo move, which is improbable, but it's possible if, if we get moving. You just said some very interesting things, but clarify for me, please, what the judo move is. Uh, to move to space-based solar manufacturing, um, mining, and resources. Not colonization, it's all near space, uh, except for the resources. Some of these asteroids have up to what, 24 quadrillion dollars worth of resources. It's like a, it's like a, you know, an ever-expanding amount of resources and energy. Uh, you can produce this energy in, in quantity. You can beam it down for virtually lossless um, beaming, even through wet weather. Uh, it can be distributed globally. You can shoot these beams sideways <laughs> from the satellite and um, switch the power that, that's actually being beamed down uh, almost instantaneously. Um, the rectennas that collect it are, are really efficient. So. Um, OK, and, and th thank you. I mean, this, this is very interesting. And, and I have seen such proposals. Uh, what I can say is that I'm a social scientist. I, I can't evaluate the technological arguments for or against this. What I will say is that even if it's feasible, if you give humans surplus energy, we find ways to use it up. Yep. And so I don't see this as a way of escaping limits. It just changes the timing of the limits. Right. I see that too. It's, it's, it gets us up to type one and beyond in terms <clears> of civilization level. Uh, have you associated kind of the mindset change that we have now? This kind of, you know, you know, I could see it because I've been associated with the space sector and everything else, and I could see this this internal focus and this internal negativity uh, and in kind of scaling back, you know, our expectations. And and is that kind of a common trait you see in civilizations in near collapse? No, no, I I couldn't say that I see well. I mean, th there is some literature in the Roman Empire um, about perceiving limits and perceiving the end. It's, it's not a lot of literature. There are always, there are always some Cassandras. There are always people who, who, who just don't see how the existing system can, can continue. Um, it, it, is it common or widespread? I, I can't say that it is or isn't, because as I say, we have some literature from the later Roman Empire expressing pessimism about the future, but how common was it? Um, you know, while these people were writing pessimistic things, the government was funding the army and sending the army out to the frontier and engaging in battles, doing everything they could to keep the system going. Um, and, 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 and ultimately, as I've argued in the book, the problem they reached was, was diminishing returns on becoming a more and more complex um, and, and top-heavy system. Um, and, and so you know, do I see pessimism? I, I, I don't know. I, I, there may be some small changes in percentages of people who write pessimistic things or, or who write um, things foreseeing a limit. I guess I'm one of those people. Uh, whether, it, whether it portends the end of a way of life, I just, I just can't say, I doubt it. Um, just as suggested for you as your research on the productivity of systems is that you know we're seeing a decline in the in the rate on Moore's law and and scale limits with that and it you know Kumi's law tends to be a little bit better which is more the energy efficiency doubles every two years and then um, we're seeing a switch generally uh, and and it's almost like a it's a substrate shift towards uh, neural networks uh, and using GPUs initially to substitute for creating neural networks and then you know creating neural networks directly um, and that's like a thousand fold increase in energy efficiency and the AIs the early AIs we're seeing right now in terms of uh, synthetic design and and both of art music uh, uh, you know we see it with pictures we see it with videos now we also see it with code is is like 
and also the kind of self-learning ca capacity of those AIs is, you know, going to is already starting to have real-world impacts in terms of what it can solve. So instead of having a team team of engineers like I've had in the past, uh, software guys working on solving a problem, it's a small group of people feeding data to a, an AI, and it teaches itself how to solve the problem. Um, and it is done in extraordinarily fast time. Um, Certainly, it would be extraordinarily fast. Um, I, I have not seen enough about AI to know what it's capable to really know what its ultimate capabilities are. Um, I mean, no computer system can do more than we instructed how to do. Um, now, now, can it solve problems in ways that we haven't considered? Maybe it can. I don't know. I'm not a software engineer. I, I am aware that that there's a lot of excitement about AI now, but. But really, really, I can't comment on it, whether it ultimately solves problems. I, I, I will say that um, that when I give talks on the innovation work that I, that we've been doing, my colleagues and I, I take care to point out that innovation is not going away anytime soon. Now, we, you know, it, among the population as a whole, I think people think of innovation as like Thomas Edison wakes up one morning and invents the light bulb. Now, that's, that's not how innovation works. Innovation consists of taking things that are, already exist and putting them together in novel ways. And there was a talk I gave on this uh, once at a technology conference, and a fellow in the audience pointed out that so many individual things have been invented now that we, we can coast for a long time just putting them together in novel ways. And I have to admit he was right, um, that in fact we can coast for a long time taking things that have already been, been invented and, and putting them together in new ways. And you, you can see that happening now with information technology. You know, if you go to buy a new car, it's essentially a, a self-mobile computer. Yeah, uh, just, a, just a suggestion on the AI, you know, there's a lot of talk of trying to do human equivalent stuff. It's not, that's never gonna happen. Everyone's trying to focus on that. It's really just this black box that has some self-learning capacity. You feed it with the right data, train it basically, and see if it, and it's, that's the, the key driver. Um, a question, I, I, I studied networks a lot and I've, I've seen like a network develop in the West that uh, was operating at the political level and now it's at the global level. And it was the network that kind of escalated the war with Russia from a kind of this regional carefully managed uh, war with a, uh, or conflict with a, a nuclear superpower to this kind of global struggle that is that it was put in. And it was mostly network driven, uh, escalated in that way, global embargo and the thing. And now we're expanding that's kind of taking over and we're going into conflicts with China and uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, India, uh, Brazil, even Lulu, Lula is like a pro Russia. So we're kind of in this like warlike, mode right now you know us and europe is any kind of thinking on this and how this fits into the you know the larger do you see it too or or not i, I don't see anything new happening right now uh, what i see okay. happening now has happened many times before in the human past with i mean what's changed now is the scale i mean the scale is now global um in the past it was smaller than that, smaller in scale than that, but uh, you know, an, an alliances and wars between alliances and uh, political persuasion and economic sanctions and so forth, it, these are nothing new. Um, you know, if, if you wanna call it a network, oh, that, a network effect, that, that's fine. I have no objections to that. Um, I, I have, I mean, I'm, a, I'm aware of that there are studies in networks. I've never really looked into that too much myself, um, to be honest with you. Um, but uh, you know, so, so, so certainly what we're seeing in, um, in global politics and conflict today, it's, it is certainly um, educational. Uh, and, and most of our population and our politicians who don't know a lot of history uh, are hopefully learning from it. But um, as, I, as I say to repeat, I, I, what I see, I, I'm familiar with. You see this as a start of kind of a deglobalization effort, which then decomplexifies in a negative way and then causes a cascade. Not unless it leads to World War Three. Okay. Go ahead. Thanks, uh, John. Uh, Thank you. Thank you so much.
My pleasure. Yeah. And definitely check out John's uh, Global Gorilla reports, uh, some of the best reports around. And he was a previous philosopher in residence twice at the Stoa. You can check out his series and put it in the chat. Um, so uh, who's next uh, for a question? Tom, you had a, a question. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Joseph, um, uh, I really want to compliment you on your the work as of 1988. Um, I took the time to listen to the audiobook today. So for you to begin with um, saying um, sustainability is the thing you're focused on, I completely agree with that. <clears throat> um, I've worked as a regional planner and <clears throat> in doing a work, uh, a chapter on sustainability, um, looked at the, the mass of the technosphere and how, um, I'm wondering how the debt, uh, which doesn't seem to be a factor in those early uh, civilizations that you um, analyzed, has allowed us to overconsume the future. So we have this massive global debt. Um, and of course, uh, easy credit allows you to bring forward consumption. And now um, I think, you know, we've overconsumed um, the future and um, we'll have to, to uh, resimplify and maybe drop down to uh, what's sustainable. Um, and thank you. Do you have a question for me? Well, um, I guess my 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 question is um, the the thing that I think we you know and you mentioned it in your earlier comment was uh, the ability to understand history. So it seems like uh, our education um, across the board seems to be not up to the challenges we're facing. So too many um, ideas um, are, are not well connected to the implementation of them in society. I, I agree with you about our educational system. I don't know how many in the audience are Americans, but I was shocked to learn a few years ago that my students don't know where the public lands came from or how the public lands came about. Now, I learned that in high school American history. Um, so in every class that I teach, I explain to them where the public lands came about because um, you know, the debates over public lands or whether to ex expand national parks or national monuments tend to come down to lies with some people claiming it's a government land grab, and I have to point out to my students, no, it's not a government land grab. The government owned the land all along. So that's just one example of my particular pet peeve um, about um, the status of our education system today. I am sure all of you probably have concerns about education today. So well, what might be a way to address that? I mean, um, the social media um, put out all kinds of information and um, uh, fact checking is, um, you know, <laughs> is almost impossible. So, so we're all going so fast into um, kind of an oblivion, it seems, because we don't really understand the foundations of, of the world that we have today. Yes. Um... One of the things I've been pointing out for the last few years is that in our history as a species, we did not evolve to be broad scale thinkers. We didn't evolve to have the capacity to think broadly in terms of time or space, because 300,000 years ago when Homo sapiens emerged, there was no need to do so. They lived short lives and they lived their lives within limited territories in which they foraged for resources. So, most humans today do not think broadly in time or space because there was never natural selection for the ability to do so. 
But sustain that is exactly what sustainability requires is the ability to think broadly in time and space. So I speculate sometimes, I wonder, are there ways to teach that? Uh, you'd have to get the children at a very early age to find some way to teach it. I'm not a K to 12 educator, so I wouldn't know how to do it. But um, I sometimes think and I sometimes say that if I was 30 or 40 years younger, I might want to spend time talking to K to 12 educators about this issue. Well, you know, in 1969, uh, Buckminster Fuller gave us the vision of Spaceship Earth. So somehow to uh, manage the technosphere of Earth and get some kind of sustainable balance uh, would be a useful vision, but uh, I don't know who can present it to the world. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop my conversation at this point so we can go on to others, but maybe you can uh, say, you know, what, where could we achieve us? Um, uh, kind of like the whole earth uh, view that was given to us by Stuart Brand and say, can we get, uh, can, could we manage the technosphere as a whole somehow in some kind of advanced uh, multi-civilizational network? What I would say to that is go into your nearest Walmart store and ask yourself how many people shopping in there are aware of this conversation we're having. And that'll tell you an answer. Yeah, that's the that's the right reply. Um, thank you, Tom. Uh, Anthony, uh, you had a question. You can unmute. You're on mute. Um, yeah. Ta -da. All right. Um, so I had two questions. I'm assuming you're going with the uh, most recent one because I think um, John kind of covered off on the the mindset required to face this. Uh, idea of less um so my question really um even just yesterday i was in a um a webinar a government-based webinar here in australia about resilience and about how we're going to do it and it's all and so there's this drive um for governments to do something um for bodies to do something this and again we keep going back to this kind of centralized command control kind of structure and then i'm in there going well this is great we're doing something and then at the same time um, I, I'm, I'm reflecting on what I hear from people who more, have more expertise in this complexity space saying, well, you know, when you're working with complex adaptive systems and emergence and all of this, really command and control systems don't work. What you need is, is a more decentralised local um, approach. And I guess, I guess that's my question is around as we face what's coming at us, um, are we... Are, is it best to, to to kind of encourage governments to do this and get behind it, or is that a bit of a um, is that is that a poison chalice, so to speak? And, and should it actually be we be decentralising and, and focusing, or is it something in between? Um, there is the old expression to think globally, to think locally, but act think globally, but act locally. Excuse me. Um, I had a student point out in a paper she wrote um, once that that expression actually first originated in 1917, if you can believe that. Um, and it's still kind of wishful thinking. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I mean, your question was a little broad. If you want to narrow it down, maybe I can give you a better answer. Uh, okay. So. Are centralized government approaches effective for facing collapse? Well, well, it's interesting because if you refer to Jared Diamond's book on collapse, he seems to like the, he seems to like dictatorships. Um, he 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 waxes poetically about um, the dictator Trujillo and what he did for the forests in the Dominican Republic, um, and it makes you wonder: um, is centralized? Um, you know, a strong centralized rule, the only solution. I don't want to say that it is. Um, I would certainly not consider someone like Bolsonaro an environmentalist or are particularly good for sustainability in future generations. Uh, I, I don't think you can give a simple answer to that. Um, and and, and the, the, the sad part is that even if you achieve effective government in one generation, 
it doesn't mean we're going to have it in the next generation. Um, I mean, this is this is the human race we're talking about with all of its problems and weaknesses. Thanks very much. Awesome. Um, there's a question in the chat, Joseph, of how you would compare your work to Jared's uh, more broadly. Um, well, well, I, he, I mean, he, he's basically an advocate um, and, and he concocts stories um, about the past to, to suit his advocacy. You know, I, I, I don't want to spend time on this, but, but I, I have criticized it very heavily. Um, it's not empirically valid. His, own, his only, he doesn't really have any real cases. I mean, his only real case is Easter Island, and he simply doesn't know the literature on Easter Island. The Easter Islanders were making round trip sea voyages of over 900 kilometers at a time when he says they had no work to build boats. Um, and, and his other cases, they're either trivial, they're small Pacific islands, or they're all cases where there were other factors involved. So I, 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 mean, I sympathize with his overall objective. Uh, I have to be very critical of how he went about that book. All right. Um, so if anyone has any uh, uh, questions, so we're going to do uh, one or two, pop in the chat. Uh, Sabina, you had a question early on. Uh, if you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Sabina, are you there? She is not there. Um, one question uh, that came up, Joseph, during our book club on your book on Sunday, was sort of like the, the personal, kind of gravitated towards the personal response to collapse. Um, this is like a heavy subject, like how do we prepare for a collapse? So there's a curiosity of how you personally prepare for the possibility of a collapse event, uh, or if you are preparing for something like that. When I was younger, um, I often thought about preparing for a collapse event, but maybe I just have too many other interesting things going on in my life. So I never actually enacted any of that. I, mean, I, I, I had friends, some of my friends who are survivalists. Um, I have a neighbor who went and bought himself a percussion rifle so that he could have a gun that would fire when civilization collapses. P people who would think in this way. Um, you know, I'm 72 years old. I no longer worry about collapse happening in my lifetime. Um, I, I did think about it. I did think about survivalism when I was younger, but never really did anything except to write and, and talk to people about it. And that's as much as I can expect myself to do. All right. So. Uh... Katie, do you have any uh, final questions for uh, Joseph? Sure, Joseph, I'm just wondering if you could make any policy recommendations or just recommendations to individuals um, in terms of trying to head off a potential collapse. What would be the things that you think that we could do that would help the most? There's no simple answer to that. I, I teach a class in sustainability at, at, at which, in, in which the final lesson is there's no simple answer. I, I mean, I do get, I get that question a lot, of course. Okay. And my standard answer is that the first step is awareness. You know, I, I appreciate that all of you here have read the book, have read things I've written about collapse and sustainability. That is the first step. Beyond that, you have to make your own decisions. I, I can't uh, you know, I, I'm a realist. I, I am not going to recommend any particular course of action because I'm pessimistic whether there are any or whether we um, are heading for dramatic change in our way of life. Collapse is always a possibility. It is a possibility. However, I, I tell my students that, that what concerns me more immediately is whether we are heading into you know, what is often called a steady state economy, an economy where there is no growth. Um, and I emphasize that I'm not advocating a steady state economy because I see a lot of problems in it. Um, but it is something that I think may be in our future. Thank you so much. All right, I think um, Sabina couldn't jump off mute, but she had a question that she wants to me to read. Let me just find it. Oh, here, here she is. Uh, um, 
She wants your opinion on the role of nuclear power in, in terms of uh, collapse. Uh, I, I, again, I don't have a simple view of it. I tend to favor nuclear power because it's one of the best alternatives we have to fossil fuels. At the same time, after the incident at the, uh, the Fukushima plant in Japan, um, I sometimes wonder, is the, is the human race intelligent enough to manage nuclear power? And then the, another question, any reading recommendations you'd like to leave us with here at the, the STOA? I, I would recommend, um, well, I, 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 two, two, two things. Um, I, I would recommend reading in energy. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have the reference in mind just right now. Um, but I would certainly recommend reading in the history of energy production, uh, what people are talking about in terms of future energy production and constraints to that. Uh, you might go online and look for um, uh, a retired ecologist named Charles Hall, um, who has written about energy um, and written rather extensively about energy. And from his, from his, from finding him, you can find the names of other people who's works are worth reading. The other thing I, I will mention is, um, is to look into the productivity of innovation. And, and, and when you encounter technological optimists, and you will encounter them, you always have to investigate, explore, what assumptions are they making that they're not aware they're making? And this is the problem that I have with technological optimists, because they are assuming that the productivity of innovation in the future will remain the same as it is now. And that it's because of that assumption that I undertook um, our innovation research. And as I said, our research shows that the productivity of innovation is declining and it will continue to decline. I don't think innovation is going away anytime soon, but I think by the end of the century, remember I'm a historian, I think long-term, by the end of the century, I think a system of innovation is gonna be very different. Uh, certain lines of research are gonna be cut back. All right, uh, so we'll uh, uh, stop here. Uh, Joseph, thank you so much for coming to STOA today. Is there any uh, uh, parting words you'd like to leave us with, perhaps where we can find uh, um, your other work or upcoming books that you are? Uh... If you'll allow me to leave for just a second, I will find um, the reference for my most recent work on sustainability. Does anyone mind if I um, change my screen to go looking uh, in my files? Yeah. Yeah, I will do so. Let's see if I can. Um, I don't know if it's going to let me. Okay. Someone's also asking if your courses are online somewhere. No, unfortunately, they aren't. Um, although if it was requested, it's possible that they could be. But you, you, you'd have to write to the university administration or maybe the dean of our college um, to ask for that. OK, coming up very soon. Um, okay, I assume everyone can still hear me. Um, almost there. Okay, um, it's a chapter in a book published in 2018. Um, the book, the title of the book is Physical Limits to Economic Growth. Perspectives of Economic, Social, and Complexity Science. Uh, so it's Physical Limits to Economic Growth, Perspectives of Economic, Social, and Complexity Science. Um, it's edited by a couple of Italian fellows, Roberto Berlando, B-U-R-L-A-N-D-O, and Angelo Tartaglia, T-A-R-T-A-G-L-I-A published by Rutledge in 2018. 
And uh, I'll give you the title of the chapter uh, because it's meaningful. It's titled Depletion Versus Innovation, The Fundamental Question of Sustainability. Um, I would also, I could also recommend um, a book that I did after the Gulf oil spill. Uh, it came out uh, in, 20, in, in 2011. Hold on, I'm looking for it. No, I'm sorry, it came out in 2012. Oh, it came out in 2012. Oh, I'm looking in the wrong place. Give me just a second here. Almost there. Okay, 2012, a book I did with a fellow named Tad Patzek, P-A-T-Z-E-K. It's titled Drilling Down, the Gulf Oil Debacle and Our Energy Dilemma. Um, I wrote chapters one, five, six, and nine. Uh, the other chapters, they're really excellent for technical reasons, but they are technical. Uh, it was published by Copernicus Books. Uh, so 2012, uh, I'm listed as first author. The title is Drilling Down, the Gulf Oil Debacle and Our Energy Dilemma. And in that book, I summarized a lot of the work that I had been doing up until that point. Um, and it's just a worthwhile book for learning about energy in general, if it's not something you work in regularly. So um, so that's it. Awesome. Thank you for those shares, Joseph. And thank you for all the great work you do. Uh, your 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 work and definitely the the book class of complex societies influenced a lot of here a lot of us out the Stoa and adjacent spaces. Um, we're looking forward to whatever you put out next. And well, uh, thanks to all of you, thank you for the invitation and thanks for your good questions. Awesome. And thanks, Katie, for emceeing today. And thanks, John, for that exchange and everyone else who asked a question. Uh, our next um, Uquake book club here at the Stoa, the Dictator's Handbook. Why uh, Bad Behavior is Almost Always Good Politics, and the author Bruce is coming in for that, so you can check that out at thestoa.ca. That being said, everyone, thanks so much for coming to Stoa today. <laughs>